Buddsy is a cannabis tech company that utilizes AI to deliver you the high you're looking for. The full-featured beta test version of their app is currently live in Santa Barbara County, California. You can learn more at budsy.io, where you can download the web app for free. Also, check out their cannabis culture podcast, Token Talk, where they speak to smokers all around the world about 420 culture in their countries. Valve is addressing recent controversy over what type of games and what kind of content can be sold on Steam with a new policy that will let virtually anything appear on the storefront as long as it's not or illegal or straight up controlled. So this is controversial, man. I feel like this is probably including adult content or whatever, but I feel like it's kind of passing the bucket a little bit, man. You know, they're passing on the bit, um, absolving themselves of any responsibility of and you know, it seems to maintain this stuff, so, uh, so they basically said, this is all for their, um, uh, executive Eric Johnson said, uh, we decided that the right approach is to allow everything onto the Steam store, except for things that we decide are illegal or straight up trolling. So that's kind of interesting, too, it says things that we decide are illegal. So, so maybe this is them policing their own, you know, environment. This looks dope, bro. Of course, there's yeah, years. years. Yeah, yeah. It's, Gonna talk about that. It's coming in games at launch. Yeah, yeah that's, that's <laughs> becoming a big thing too. Yeah, but, so, uh, but that is interesting because you know that's that's such a weird way to say it. Mm -hmm. Is is that we deem to be illegal, okay, or straight up trolling? What does that mean? Straight, straight up trolling. I feel like so. A fight for the guys could be considered straight up trolling. Uh, maybe, yeah. yeah, I could see that, and and I mean, maybe that's what this is, is because you see all the school shootings in the news, and and this guy came out with the game almost immediately after one happened, and released it finally, yeah. and uh, so that's, I guess, it's straight up trolling, right? Uh, I mean, I, I, I don't know, man, that, 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 that's a pretty big gray that's area. Been named illegal. That's I feel like, I feel like, maybe, 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 maybe it's maybe. a gray area. Maybe. Maybe. Oh yeah, no, you're in the right place. Just getting ourselves together here. That was uh, Corey Rashad and guest over on the most recent episode of From the Canopy. Uh, great podcast I've been listening to for mm, months now, going on a year. Corey's a podcast mentor of mine and a member of several podcasting like creator mutual support groups on Facebook with me, um, including as of uh, recently here, the Podcast Builders League, of course, our group. Um, you know, he brings you, as you could tell right there, uh, commentary on gaming, on popular music, pop culture in general, social issues, just timely social issues, you name it. If it's uh, of, you know, general interest to us as uh, North American adults these days with a you know, particular slant uh, or interest in that, you know, movies, celebrity fun, games, um, music, range, you're going to find them talking about it over on From the Canopy. To hear the rest of the conversation about Valve and what Valve's newest version of their, we won't call it a digital rights management uh, policy, but uh, the um, sort of the user terms and what would be allowed to be published to the Steam store for download. Um, hear the rest of the conversation over at From the Canopy. I'll, of course, leave links for you in the show notes to find them. Uh, we actually were listening to that episode, getting ready to start our episode today while I was also looking into 
a story that Corey shared with me about deep fake videos, which is something that we've touched upon previously on this show. And I'm going to try to do my best to dig back into my show notes and episode notes and find which episode the original references to it were so that I can also point newer listeners back at that soon. Um, we'll get to that story on deepfake as well as a bunch of other fun stuff. Uh, I got a bunch of fun stuff to bring to you this week on our episode today. Um, as is usually the case, though, I need to roll up. We're going to get our strain of the week rolled up. Solstice, Solstice Cannabis Company uh, did a limited drop of a really cool new to the Pacific Northwest strain called Nookies. It's a collaboration with the fairly famous Swamp Boys and uh, uh, Genetics uh, House. and It's a sativa-leaning strain, so uh, get ready. Not unlike the Blueberry Headband episode, uh, I know for a fact from having already sampled these nookies that I am going to be fired up after I get this baby in me. So let's uh, get yourselves a drink, get yourselves a cup of tea, get yourselves squared away with a freshie, fresh bowl or a fresh roll, a little dab, grab your pen if you're, you know, working and trying to stay busy. Just let us go in the background here. I'll uh, get some tunes going for us while I get ready to roll up. We'll come right back and dive in. So I'm still with you here while I'm, while I have my, I have my beverage. I'm gonna grind some of these nookies up and roll a joint with them, like I like to do. But I thought we'd enjoy some music by Auntie Luode, our royalty-free music provider and uh, friend from the internet. Originally the Reddits, but Auntie and I follow each other pretty closely on Instagram these days. So I hope. He's occasionally turning in, tuning in, that is, to the podcast. And if so, Auntie, love you, brother. Thank you so much for the tunes, as always. So the Nookies has an amazing, amazing, like, bright citrus, like, floral top note to me. Uh, so you guys know uh, it is animal cookies crossed with Nigerian. Nigerian being a sativa-leaning, well, sativa, straight sativa land race strain, if I'm not mistaken. Um... And we'll look it up together as well. Um, got this at a limited drop at Clutch Cannabis down in Renton. Uh, and also was stoked to receive the same text message that anybody who shops down there would receive, uh, which was an invitation to join them for a uh, private uh, hangout session at their off-site smoking lounge. Um, fantastic party. Uh, like catered with local chicken from Heaven Sent. Uh, the Solstice crew were there uh, in force and keeping everybody rolled up and dabbed up with uh, Nookie's Live Resin and the Nookie's Flower, uh, both of which were absolutely fantastic um, and definitely worth me departing from my normal heavy indica type rotation to uh, dabble in the sativa end of the pool for just a little bit. And, and really, uh, you know, saying that, you know, my... My threshold with sativa only gets hit when, you know, that heart rate starts kicking up and I get that neurotic nervousness. Um, and I think as long as I don't go too crazy with this stuff, uh, it has yet to treat me like that. Um, so, you know, that may be the animal cookies side of the hybrid there. Uh, helping me out, you know, providing a little ballast. Got my little... Um, Made in Taiwan, uh, Hawaii commemorative souvenir, like hors d'oeuvre tray, that is being pressed into service as a, as a thrift shop find. It is. It was instantly recognized by me as a rolling tray, so that's what we're using it for. It's a nice woven bamboo 
little tray, but it's hilarious because on the very back, you know, first they tell you all about Hawaii on the front. Um, I'll show you some pictures of it. It's like a Hawaii map and a couple of hibiscus flowers or something like that and a hula girl. And on the back, it talks about the bamboo, how great it is. And then under it is a tiny little sticker that says made in Taiwan. <laughs> um, it's it's really typical, like, 70s, 80s era Hawaiian souvenir or, you know, any kind of... Uh, Pacific Island souvenir. Um, or fuck, you can get this shit everywhere all around the world. Alright. It does become a little more complicated to roll and talk at the same time. using a little uh, rolling machine um, from a company called OCB um, and I found it oh where did I find it oh, I think I got this at Ocean Greens up in North Seattle and I just liked the look of it because it was like an open a wide open um, rolling machine my Chong roller like clamshells closed and stuff and I have to always empty it out and clean it out not a big deal, um, but definitely something that I notice about using that that unit. This has to be cleaned out a lot. And this OCB, anything that doesn't make it into the joint just sort of falls falls out all around it right back into your tray. So uh, it's also a smaller uh, doobie which that it wants to roll, you know, like a cigarette um, size class uh, unit. Um, and... Yeah, that's, none of that's working, because I did this all backwards and upside down, because I'm a ding-dong, because we're talking. All right, we got it, we got it. It don't matter. It don't matter. All right, I like that, though. Yeah, so I like this construction. So it's bamboo. It's smaller, so it's not like these big cannons, my huge unnecessary joints that I like to roll a lot of the time. Uh, and in fact, I need, I'm hunting for a small enough paper to use in it unmodified. Actually, I'm having to trim down <laughs> larger papers to use them in here. That's fine, though. My friend Matt on SeshCast, he spends, you know, a little bit more time of his pod, you know, talking and doing the, like, this down downtime stuff just sharing his experience of the actual smoke session with folks i think than i do and i kind of i kind of i dig it matt so um excuse me goldilocks is his microphone radio handle podcast handle so we'll call him goldilocks that's a sesh cast though if you want to have if you if you need one more smoking cast in your rotation um, Goldilocks does a great job and, you know, talks about his different strains and stuff each week that he's messing with and his glass a lot and what those different smoking experiences are like and then he just waxes philosophical on topics diverse. All right. So, I should say, yeah, so here I am, getting all rolled up. I guess it goes without saying, folks, if you're just arriving, walk it into the room where somebody else is already listening to Baked and Awake. If the name didn't give it away, FYI, this podcast contains some serious cannabis conversation. And yes, cannabis consumption. So, um, we do this from a legal state here in Washington State. And we do it with every intention of being upfront about that use. However we can. This show is about cannabis and how wonderful it is and how good it is for us. And destigmatizing it and letting it flourish in the light of day. Uh, because we can, in 2018, in Washington State, to a great extent, celebrate that. To perhaps the greatest extent, you know, as is allowed anywhere in, in the world right now. So... Um, 
All right. We're going to jump right into a bit of a cuz you know we talked about we talked about the cannabis a little bit. We talked about nookies a little bit in terms of uh what we've got. We're going to talk about its effects on me as they become apparent on the mic here pretty soon and I have a pretty good idea that the next two to three stories that I drop in on and tell you guys about here today are going to be more than enough to get me uh, a little fired up, to say the least. Um, Starting with this one. Coming from CNET.com via way of my usual slash dot dot org news consumption tunnel probably my favorite news source on the web these days slash dot uh, but they source they posted to someone you know a uh, a member of slash dot posted this article from cnet the other day and uh many of you will be aware of this but net neutrality according to cnet here just the other day june 11th Marguerite Reardon is our writer. She says, net neutrality is really officially dead. Now what? This calls for a smoke. There are no more procedural delays on the FCC's decision. The rules have been rolled back. Here's everything you need to know. The Obama era net neutrality rules passed in 2015 are defunct. This time it's for real. Though some minor elements of the proposal by Republican led FCC to roll back those net neutrality rules went into effect last month. Most aspects still required approval from the Office of Management and Budget. That's now been taken care of, with the Federal Communications Commission declaring June 11th as the date the proposal takes effect. That's the date of the publication of this article. While many people agree with the basic principles of net neutrality, the specific rules enforcing the idea have been a lightning rod for controversy. That's because to get the rules to hold up in court, an earlier Democrat-led FCC had reclassified broadband networks so that they fell under the same strict regulations that govern telephone networks. FCC Chairman Ajit Pai has called the Obama-era rules, quote, heavy-handed and a mistake. And he's argued that they deterred innovation and depressed investment in building and expanding broadband networks. He has an op-ed that he wrote for CNET. They include the link to it there in the article in line. Written by Pai himself. To set things right, he says, he's taking the FCC back to a, quote, light-touch approach to regulation, a move that Republicans and Internet service providers have applauded. That's my first warning bell. They like it. I know I'm not going to like it. Let's bring in a little light music to lighten it up. (laughs) But supporters of net neutrality, such as big tech companies like Google and Facebook, as well as consumer groups and pioneers of the Internet, like World Wide Web creator Tim Berners-Lee. That's right, not Al Gore. Say the internet, as we know it may not exist without these protections. We need a referee on the field who can throw a flag, former FCC chairman and Obama appointee Tom Wheeler said at MIT during a panel discussion in support of rules like those he championed. Wheeler was chairman when the rules passed three years ago. You can read his op-ed in CNET regarding internet privacy here. Again, inline link to a story by... Tom Wheeler. Statement, whatever you want to call it. If you still don't feel like you understand what all the hubbub is about, have no fear. 
We've assembled this fact to put everything in plain English. And this is good. I read this. I like this. Let's recap. What is going on here? Why are we talking about this? Because <laughs> there's stories from the last week going around about the administration. I don't know if it's the... Yeah, Department of Homeland Security wants to track independent media all over the world, and particularly in North America, I'm sure, including folks who run like little independent blogs and, yes, podcasts. So, what is net neutrality again? Puff, puff, puff. Net neutrality is the principle that all traffic on the internet should be treated equally regardless of whether you're checking Facebook, posting pictures to Instagram, or streaming movies from Netflix or Amazon. Or I should add, you're producing or consuming serious work out there on the internet. <laughs> Publishing content, downloading content, not just entertainment. It also means companies like AT&T, which is trying to buy Time Warner, or Comcast, which owns NBC Universal, can't favor their own content over a competitor's. You, see, you get that? So AT&T owns Time Warner. AT&T, a communications company, owns Time Warner, a media company. Comcast, a cable service provider, owns NBC Universal, a major content creator, provider. Okay. Smart strategy, conflict of interest, vertical integration, monopolistic looking market, you know, paradigms. I don't know. I'm not an economist. But net neutrality is designed to set up and mitigate for would-be conflicts like this, okay? Calling out ahead of time to the AT&Ts and the Comcasts of the world that they can't favor that Time Warner content or NBC Universal content over a competitor who's also relying on their infrastructure to deliver their content into people's homes onto their magic, sacred, glowing rectangles. So next they say, so what is happening? That was what's net neutrality. What is happening? The FCC, led by Ajit Pai, voted on December 14th to repeal the 2015 net neutrality regulations, which prohibited broadband providers from blocking or slowing down traffic and banned them from offering so-called fast lanes to companies willing to pay extra to reach consumers more quickly than competitors. Under the 2015 rules, the FCC reclassified broadband as a utility, which gave it the authority to regulate broadband infrastructure as much as it did the old telephone network. The most significant change resulting from the proposal is the stripping away of the FCC's authority to regulate broadband and the shifting of that responsibility to the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission. Does this mean no one will be policing the internet? The FTC will be the new cop on the beat. It can take action against companies that violate contracts with consumers or that participate in anti-competitive and fraudulent activity. So what's the big deal? Is the FTC equipped to make sure broadband companies don't harm consumers? The FTC already oversees consumer protection and competition for the whole economy. This also means the agency is swamped. And because the FTC isn't focused exclusively on the telecommunications sector, it's unlikely the agency could deliver the same kind of scrutiny the FCC would. More importantly, the FTC also lacks the FCC's rulemaking authority. This means FTC enforcement extends only to companies' voluntary public commitments or to violations of antitrust law. Unless broadband and wireless carriers commit in writing to basic net neutrality principles, the FTC can only enforce antitrust issues, which must meet a high legal standard.
Also, any action the FTC takes happens after the fact. Meaning, they have to do something wrong and get caught doing something wrong that they agreed to not do voluntarily in writing ahead of time. And they conclude, and investigations of wrongdoing can take years. Excuse me. What about internet fast lanes? Will broadband providers be able to prioritize traffic? The repeal of FCC net neutrality regulations removes the ban that keeps a service provider from charging an internet service, like Netflix or YouTube, a fee for delivering its service faster to customers than its competitors can. Net neutrality supporters argue that this especially hurts startups, which can't afford such fees. Yeah, like maybe Netflix, Hulu, and the rest can weather this storm, but that means now there's a gate on anybody new coming in trying to compete because they very likely will face this kind of challenge. Packaged to them in the form of something marketed to them, no doubt. Like they said, the fast lane. But Pai said the ban on paid priority was too restrictive. He wanted to make sure broadband companies could experiment with different business models, such as offering more zero-rated deals, which allow companies to give away content for free without accounting against a customer's monthly data cap. Another potential business model would let a broadband provider give priority, priority to a medical application or to services like those enabling self-driving cars. They have a little two-minute video that says, watch this. Beer helps explain battle brewing over net neutrality. <laughs> I didn't watch it. Uh, we'll, 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 maybe I'll watch it after the fact. You guys can watch it and check it out. Have any of the old rules been left in place? The one rule that was spared is the so-called transparency rule, which requires broadband providers to disclose how they manage their networks. Sounds like bullshit. <laughs> The FCC now requires service providers to commit to disclosing when and under what circumstances they block or slow traffic, and to disclose if and when they offer paid priority services. What's it all mean for me? This is a huge change in policy at the FCC, and it could affect how you experience the Internet. Keep in mind, your experience isn't likely to change right away. But over time, it could change significantly. Whether you think that change will be for the better or the worse depends on whom you believe. Yeah, I mean, I've even, I've even seen, you know, somebody who in a lot of cases I like his content a lot of and, you know, this isn't sniping at a big fish here. This is just an observation. I, um, uh, James Corbett of the Corbett Report had a guest on a couple different times, at least now. He was pretty pro net neutrality repeal, and uh, it's not convincing to me in, in their arguments. Um, I'm not going to try to recreate them or paraphrase them poorly here to my benefit and their detriment either. So. Um, if you want to hear somewhat erudite sounding discourse that would tend to indicate that this isn't the bad thing that most of us little guys like me, um, little wannabe indie podcaster dudes uh, and, and stuff think like that this is the beginning of the end for smaller independent media platforms versus the big ones that are going to be able to, you know, instantly absorb 
any fees, no matter how draconian. Fees or new costs of doing business, however we want to phrase it. Or new opportunities to improve their performance. It, this is a mess. This is, you know. But I mean, Steve, be quiet. As always, I tell myself, shut up, read the story. I'm stealing these people's story. You should read it properly. <laughs> Pi and many other Republicans say freeing up broadband providers from onerous and outdated regulation will let them invest more in their networks. They're hopeful this will lead to more expansion in rural and hard-to-service areas of the country, as well as higher-speed service throughout the U.S. The agency's argument for repealing the rules is that investment started to decline in 2015 after the rules were adopted. But Democrats, like Senator Ed Markey of Massachusetts, consumer advocacy groups, civil rights organizations, and technology companies like Google and Mozilla say that repealing the 2015 rules and stripping the FCC of its authority will lead to broadband companies controlling more of your internet experience. As companies like AT&T, Verizon, and Comcast acquire more online content like video, they could give their own services priority on their networks, squeezing out competitors and limiting what you can access. This might mean fewer startups get a shot at becoming the next Facebook, Netflix, or YouTube. Ultimately, it could lead to your internet experience looking more like cable TV, where all the content is curated by your provider. Some critics also fear this control could lead to higher prices. That's certainly one that most of us have feared and talked about, I think, up to this point. Groups such as the American Civil Liberties Union say it could affect your First Amendment right to free speech as big companies control more of what you experience online. Internet rights are civil rights, said Jay Stanley, an ACLU senior policy analyst. Gutting net neutrality will have a devastating effect on free speech online. Without it, gateway corporations like Comcast, Verizon, and AT&T will have too much power to mess with the free flow of information. What's next? Net neutrality supporters have filed lawsuits to reinstate the old rules. Several tech companies, including Vimeo, Mozilla, Kickstarter, Foursquare, and Etsy, as well as several state attorneys general, have launched lawsuits against the FCC to preserve net neutrality rules. Okay, so as of the other day, we have a few, you know, instant objections by hopefully worthy objectors <laughs> um, that maybe we'll see some you know, grassroots support that we can bring to those in the form of petitions, etc. They argue that the FCC's decision to change the classification of broadband and to get rid of the rules violates the Administrative Procedure Act because it is, quote, arbitrary and capricious. States are also taking matters into their own hands. This includes Washington State, I know. More than two dozen states, including California, New York, Connecticut, and Maryland, are considering or pushing legislation to reinstate, reinstate net neutrality rules within their borders. Earlier this year, Washington became the first state to sign such legislation into law. Yeah, we, we're, we've got it supposedly preserved here in Washington State. I don't know how that works exactly, but I guess if you want to push your content to customers in our market, you have to conform. Governors in several states, including New Jersey and Montana, have signed executive orders requiring ISPs that do business with the state 
to adhere to net neutrality principles. That sounds basically like it. Apparently they have that authority. Will Congress take action? Doesn't seem like it. It doesn't, seems like they're the ones who did it to us. But um, While the FCC has voted to repeal the regulations, proponents are trying to keep them alive. In May, the Senate passed Congressional Review Act, a way to overrule the agency. Find out how every senator voted here, they put for you. Again, a nice link. But the House has yet to take action. Leading Senate Democrats urged Speaker Paul Ryan to schedule a vote. There's a larger majority of Republicans in the House, though, so it is unlikely the CRA would go through. Yeah, like even if he consented to it, they can automatically just swat it. And then, yeah, there's the kicker. Ultimately, the CRA would still need to be signed by President Donald Trump. But it's unlikely that Trump would countermand Pi, one of his appointees. Still, supposedly, it's happened before. Well, sure, yeah, but this, uh, this seems like the, exactly the kind of thing he would love to not worry about. <laughs> Uh, or stop in any way. Congress could still write laws protecting an open internet, but some net neutrality supporters aren't confident the Republican-held legislature will protect the basic principles of net neutrality. For example, Republican or yeah, Republican Marsha Blackburn, a Republican from Tennessee, and chair of the House Commun Communications and Technology Subcommittee has proposed a bill that prohibits internet providers from blocking and throttling content, but doesn't address whether ISPs can create fast lanes of traffic for sites willing to pay. In fact, during a hearing last week discussing network prioritization, another name for that, probably Blackburn made the case for why broadband providers should be allowed to offer priority services. <laughs> she likened paid priority on the, inter the internet to signing up for TSA pre-checks at the airport. Here's what she said in her opening statement at a subcommittee hearing on paid prioritization. In real life, all sorts of interactions are prioritized every day. What about TSA pre-check? It just might have saved you time as you traveled here today. Uh... So obviously, it's not that's not an okay <laughs> uh, example, and, and you know they they point out that the people paying the fee for quicker access aren't consumers, but rather companies. These companies that we've been talking about this whole time delivering the services, and if those companies can't afford the fees, their services are likely to be relegated to slow lanes. Therefore, it'll look shitty, perform shitty. You won't want to spend time there because their site and their content is seemingly broken or just slow, right? Who wants to hang out in the slow lane? The result will be fewer innovative services for customers because you 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 know you got who we already got right now. Whoever can afford to stay ahead in the fast lane. If consumers want faster access to the internet, they can already pay for that by buying a faster speed service. They point out that ensures all of their services are delivered more quickly right now. Okay, so right now we're in a position where everything's being pushed out at one, you know, equitable, full power rate and speed. And as you unlock as the consumer successfully zippier internet, it all just works better together, right? By paying for that high speed, that broadband. That gigabit. So, yeah, they, we, we lose that under this kind of paradigm. So, yeah, you know, could a new FCC controlled by Democrats reverse course, question mark? Yes, if the Dems control the White House in 2020, yeah, you know, I mean, this is, I'm not going to go into a, a political pitch. They're done with the info of the article. Uh, what can we do now? They say the fight isn't over yet. They're calling on those who care about the issue to continue pushing state legislatures to pass their own net neutrality measures here in Washington state. I know we passed a, a, a net neutrality measure of some sort that's got us more or less supposedly protected, right? So I hope whatever state 
you know you're listening to this in in, in North America, um, you folks either already are on it, have handled it, or are about to handle it in short order, so that we can maybe at the state level across the country <laughs> stop this madness. It doesn't seem it doesn't seem right <laughs> to me at all. I don't know. All right. So yeah, that was. Um, you know, published initially uh, back in April and then corrected and updated um, up through June 11th. So I think that was a great story. Um, CNET, you know, continues to just keep bringing it up on their level of this website. Looks like it could be CNN, you know, put it that way, uh, where we're checking out this content right now or, or medium for that matter. It's pretty clean looking. It looks good. So Marguerite Reardon on June 11th. Um, most recently, uh, link in the show notes on that one. That's an editing trick. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. So now, when I need to know to go back and get rid of this, I'll just look for the, the spike in the sound. Oh, okay. Right. Oh, clap right. it to the mic, yeah. and it creates one spike. Oh, okay. See yeah. that? That's what I, I thought do. you were trying I thought... to do a, a clap one. Yeah, no. Clap one. What the fuck? <laughs> clap, man. Shit. <laughs> 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 oh. All right, we were good. <laughs> now that I know. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I come back in hot. I, I come back the... in hot like an eight-year-old lady. Clapping <laughs> off her lamp. That's how I come in. That was my hip snapping. Hey, what are you doing over there, you cocksucker? He's dying laughing. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't laugh on show. I'm going to get this shit back on the rails. Oh, go ahead, man. Go ahead. I am the talent. This is fucking funny, man. You have to keep clapping into the fucking microphone like a maniac. <laughs> you motherfuckers are beating me up the whole fucking time. <laughs> Just trying to get this shit going. Clapping in, clapping out, <laughs> clapping in, clapping out. <laughs> Dude, I get bitched it by you if I don't fucking go and take shit out of the fucking program. Uh, it's fucking damaged goods. Yeah. Okay, okay. The yeah. only show that you can clap on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The only show you can get the clap on. <laughs> Boom. Damaged goods. All right, we're back. Thank you, Damaged Goods, THC, Sith Lord, Fireball Jesus there in a little snippet of the chaos that goes on pretty much every episode over at the Damaged Goods show. Uh, those are my friends and colleagues from the Damaged Goods network that I'm proud to say Baked and Awake is a recently uh, added member of, along with that show right there, The Damaged Goods Show, Daddy Issues, Beta Testing, Claytime in the Basement, and the latest addition to The Damaged Goods Network, Family Needless to Say. Each of those podcasts is really diverse, uh, different from each other and from my own, uh, and each one is really entertaining and fun in its own way. Um, we'll showcase each of them from time to time here on the show in little different ways. Um, hope you guys enjoyed that little quick break. About to get serious here. I got a pack of fresh bowl for this next story. And I think this is going to be our last story for uh, this episode, which will be like kind of like a two-parter because I'm going to just jump right back in and probably press play on uh, or press record on episode 46 and go after the next couple of stories that I had sort of initially hoped to include in, in one episode. Um, but I think as it is, we'll still, you know, probably cross that hour threshold before we're done here today. So, um, but yeah, I'm going to get my story up in front of me here, get my notes Mm -mm. All right, smelling that fresh flower out of the out of the jar. Still on that nookies that we were messing with yesterday. I'm just gonna smoke it in a bowl right now because it's even more expedient than rolling up right at this moment because we wanna we wanna do this. All right, so net neutrality—that's a bummer. 
we're, we're in the fight to the death on that one. Um, speaking of things that are dead or dying, our expectation of privacy uh, as U.S. citizens in the land of the free, home of the brave, is, uh, well, daily under attack on numerous fronts, as we've discussed in, you know, some detail on a number of occasions here. Uh, and we've talked about Homeland Security here and there, but to get specific right now, I want to bring us up to speed on a story that I saw go out. I think I'm on my news feed somewhere in the last week or two, but maybe it was in one of our groups, like a Facebook podcaster group. It could very well have been. Um, I did a little clicking around and found my way, though, to the sort of the fountainhead of the information on this, and this article was published uh, on June 7th of this year, uh, and this is on EFF.org. So EFF, if you're not familiar with them, that's the Electronic Frontier Foundation, and they're probably the biggest, like, advocacy and policy, you know, public uh, voice for, you know, what um, what an open and free internet should really embody and where... Um, transgressions against that have taken place, um, you know, quantifying them uh, and and forming, you know, uh, either responses to um, or other actions, uh, initiatives uh, taken or put forward, posited, uh, proliferated by them uh, out into the world to try to stand up for people's rights. Um ensure the free exchange of information, ensure the internet remains, you know, the free uh, place that we know it is today, sort of the whole uh, access to information as a basic human right is, you know, definitely woven deeply into their mission. Uh, So uh, this is the EFF's website, and the story that we're going to talk about is HART, H-A-R-T. There's some nice upbeat background music for us for this story. Homeland Security's massive new database will include face recognition, DNA, and people's non-obvious relationships. Yeah. I can't believe I just read those words out loud in a story about, this is not a fictional story, this isn't Black Mirror. Facial recognition, DNA, and people's, quote, non-obvious relationships. This was written by Jennifer Lynch for the EFF on June 7th. Let's spark, though. All right. Yikes. I'm not going to lie. I had a tiny bit of Keef here. Well, not a tiny bit. I had a gram of it. And I'm just piling sativas on sativas here. I got some blue power keef that I sprinkled on top of the uh, nookies here. Also acquired that at Clutch. Dude, this keef is almost 50% THC. Um, 48.28, 48.77% total THC. Um, and uh, yeah, woo. Pow, pow. All right. So, let's see here. So, this is a big, scary program. And they lead in, you know, they're going to be tracking basically our biometrics and people, you know, people who you would like to think that you have a low-key relationship with, that you're not, you know, putting it on Front Street, that you're BFFs on Facebook and everywhere else that you spend your time. Um, how are they going to track these things? Well, they're going to tell us. To what extent are they going to do it? They're going to help us understand that, too. They say here, so why do we know so little about it? The U.S. Department of Homeland Security, DHS, is quietly building what will likely become the largest database of biometric and biographic data on citizens and foreigners in the United States. The agency's new Homeland Advanced Recognition Technology, or HART, database 
will include multiple forms of biometrics, from face recognition to DNA, data from questionable sources, and highly personal data on innocent people. It will be shared with federal agencies outside of DHS, as well as state and local law enforcement and foreign governments. And yet we still know very little about it. Holy flip, you guys. I mean, this isn't totally a new program, okay? I think this thing has been going since like 2014 too, by the way, in some form. The records DHS plans to include in heart will chill and deter people from exercising their First Amendment protected rights to speak, assemble, and associate. Data like face recognition makes it possible to identify and track people in real time, including at lawful political protests and other gatherings. Other data DHS is planning to collect including information about people's relationship patterns and from officer encounters with the public, can be used to identify political affiliations, religious activities, and familial and friendly relationships. These data points are also frequently colored by conjecture and bias. In late May, EFF Again, these folks, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, filed comments criticizing DHS's plans to collect, store, and share biometric and biographic records it receives from external agencies and to exempt this information from the Federal Privacy Act. These newly designated External Biometric Records, or EBRs, will be integral to DHS's bigger plans to build out heart. As we told the agency in our comments, DHS must do more to minimize the threats to privacy and civil liberties posed by this vast new trove of highly sensitive personal data. Minimize threats. How about stay the fuck out? 100%. That's impossible. Never happened. We're, as you sit here, we're all being violated. Every one of us. My dumb ass a little bit more than some others because I'm sitting here talking on a microphone about it. Nope. I'm banging into stuff while I'm at it. Try THC's clap. Then he's going to tell me that only works if I go back and actually take the shit part out. So they got a table in here. I'm not going to go into it. It says DHS biometric systems from ident to heart. See, so that's the thing. Well, so yeah, I mean, you know, so they have a, a fiscal year 2010 through fiscal year 2022. So as of the creation of that chart, it was fiscal year 2016. From 2010 to 2016, the numbers in tran biometric transactions, that's them hanging on to details about us and, and collating it into a file somewhere, went from... 45 or 50 million in 2010 to over 100 million by 2016. Now we're in 2018. They were projecting in at that point in time that we would be at 130 million and we're probably there or higher per year. Per year. Biometric transactions per year. So they get, you know, this is fresh stuff that they're collecting on people too all the time. Um, so, formerly that program was called IDENT, as in identify, right? And it was a fingerprint database, d data, basically a fingerprint database, but all pumped up on steroids and computers and linked up state to state, right? And being, you know, used uh, by many different agencies at many different levels. So, 
They go on. DHS currently collects a lot of data. Its legacy IDENT fingerprint database contains information on 220 million unique individuals and processes 350,000 fingerprint transactions every day. This is an exponential increase from 20 years ago when IDENT only contained information on 1.8 million people. Between IDENT and other DHS managed databases, the agency manages over 10 billion biographic records and adds 10 to 15 million more each week. 10 billion, quick math, is a lot more than even if we say the United States is close to 300 million people in it at this point in time. 300 million to 10 billion. They're tracking everybody, you guys. Everybody who visits. At all. Would be my guess, is how you get to 10 billion. All right. Another big table showing their data landscape. Um, summarized. You know, yeah, you guys look at this one when you look at the story. It'll be in the show notes. Let me get back into the story here. DHS's new heart database will allow the agency to vastly expand the types of records it can collect and store. All right, we got 10 billion records already. They want to vastly expand it. <laughs> heart will support at least seven types of biometric identifiers, including face and voice data, DNA, scars and tattoos, and a blanket category for something called other modalities. It'll also include biographic information like name, date of birth, physical descriptors, country of origin, and government ID numbers. And it will include data we know to be highly subjective, including information collected from officer encounters with the public and information about people's, quote, relationship patterns. We'll see if our audio today picks up on that wonderful fly that just came into the room and is buzzing around behind us. So they say next, Hart will impinge on First Amendment rights, you think? DHS plans to include records in Hart that will chill speech and deter people from associating with others. This stuff has occurred to me already plenty of times before. It's probably people already not associating with me <laughs> for so many reasons. Ah. Anyway, I'm talking about in the context of, you know, either my career in cannabis or my recent activities with the podcast project and just the subject matter of things that I've been discussing. I, I could absolutely see certain people in my extended social circles somewhere at some layer who, you know, are either aware of it overtly because I've communicated what I'm doing or, you know, through the grapevine or what have you, um, and who have, you know, gone ahead and distanced consciously or subconsciously because <clears throat> this kind of stuff just works on you psychologically, in my opinion. All right, again, shutting down my own commentary, getting back to it. DHS's face recognition rollout is especially concerning. The agency uses mobile biometric devices that can identify faces and capture face data in the field, allowing its ICE, Immigration, and CBP custom officers to scan everyone with whom they come into contact. Whether or not these people are suspected of any criminal activity or an immigration violation, DHS is also partnering with airlines and other third parties to collect face images from travelers entering and leaving the U.S. When combined with data from other government agencies, these troubling collection practices will allow DHS to build a database large enough to identify and track all people in public places without their knowledge. Not just in places the agency oversees like airports, but anywhere there are cameras. 
police abuse of facial recognition technology is not a theoretical issue. It's happening today. Law enforcement has already used face recognition on public streets and at political protests. During the protests surrounding the death of Freddie Gray in 2015, Baltimore police ran social media photos against a face recognition database to identify protesters and arrest them. Recent Amazon promotional videos encourage police agencies to acquire that company's face recognition with a no C and a K capabilities and use them with body cameras and smart cameras to track people throughout cities. At least two U.S. cities are already using recognition. They have a link to who those are. Let's see who they are. It's probably Seattle. <laughs> uh, every time it runs it obvious in this story, I'm looking to see if I can catch a city. Washington County. Boom. Uh, they offered it. I don't know if they accepted it. They offered it to Washington County. California and Arizona have at least contacted Washington County asking about recognition. So it looks like it's being tested in Washington County. Which that, I think, is in our state. So great. Mm -hmm. All right. Anyway, wonderful. Moving on. DHS compounds face recognition's threat to anonymity and free speech by planning to include, quote, records related to the analysis of relationship patterns among individuals. So just listen to the wording of statements like that. It's super vague and at the same time, you know, like super invasive. Records related to the analysis of relationship patterns among individuals. So... Any record related, what's the definition of related? Well, they say it's related, it's related. They want to analyze relationship patterns. Okay, so that's any interaction you've had with a person, however light or casual, they're going to classify as a relationship if they want to, and then dig in on that in an analysis among individuals, among anybody. It's anybody who you, any of us, interact with. They're, they're going to run us like the Sims. Exactly, so they, they, they say it right here. We don't know where DHS or its external partners will be getting these, quote, relationship pattern records, but they could come from social media profiles and posts, which the government plans to track by collecting social media usernames from all foreign travelers entering the country. They don't need to collect them from us because they've already got them, if you're listening here in North America. Social media records, even if they are publicly available, can include highly personal and private information, and the fear that the government may be collecting and searching through this information may cause people to self-censor what they say online. <clears throat> the data collected also won't be limited to information about foreign travelers. Travelers' social media records may include information on family members and friends who are U.S. citizens, or lawful permanent permanent residents, two groups protected explicitly by the Privacy Act. So here's where they overreach against us. As the recent repeated Facebook scandals are showing us, even when you think you've done everything you can to protect your own data, it could be easily disclosed without your control through actions of your friends and contacts, or through Facebook itself. DHS's relationship pattern records will likely be misleading or inaccurate. DHS acknowledges that these records will include non-obvious relationships, whatever that means. 
However, if the relationships are, quote, non-obvious, one has to question whether they truly exist. Instead, DHS could be seeing connections among people that are based on nothing more than, quote, liking the same news article, using the same foreign words, or following the same organization on social media. This is highly problematic because records like these frequently inform officer decisions to stop, search, and arrest people. DHS plans to include additional records in HART that could be based on or impact First Amendment protected speech and activity. Records will include miscellaneous officer comment information and encounter data. These types of information come from police interactions with civilians. A little crunchy on my volume adjust there. Let's try it with the gain instead. Take this guy down a little bit. I like where he's going with it, but it's the volume's a little higher on it. Gotta get that thing up off a red line. So, these types of information, encounter data, miscellaneous officer comment information, these types of information come from police interactions with civilians and are often collected under extremely questionable legal circumstances. For example, ICE officers use mobile devices to collect biometric and biographic data from people they encounter in the field, including via unauthorized entry into people's homes and Bible study groups <laughs> and in public places where people congregate with other members of their community such as on soccer fields in community centers and on buses damn encounters like these whether they are conducted by ICE or by state or local police are frequently not based on individualized suspicion that a civilian has done anything wrong but that doesn't prevent the officer from stockpiling any information obtained from the civilian during the encounter. Finally, DHS relies on data from gang databases, its own, and those from states, which often contain unsubstantiated data concerning people's status and associations and are notoriously inaccurate. DHS is even fabricated gang status as an excuse to deport people. Part will include inaccurate data and will share that data with other agencies. Yeah, so it just proliferates it and makes it gives it more, you know, weight. DHS is not taking necessary steps with its new heart database to determine whether it's own data and the data collected from its external partners are sufficiently accurate to prevent innocent people from being identified as criminal suspects, immigration law violators, or terrorists. DHS has stated that it intends to rely on face recognition to identify data subjects across a variety of its mission areas and Quote, face matching is one of the first components of the heart database to be built out. However, facial recognition is frequently inaccurate and unreliable as a biometric identifier. DHS tests of its own systems found significantly high levels of inaccuracy. The systems falsely rejected as many as 1 in 25 travelers. As a Georgetown report recently noted, DHS's error-prone face scanning system could cause 1,632 passengers to be wrongfully delayed or denied boarding every day at New York's JFK International Airport alone. Like if they were to implement it fully. <laughs> DHS's external partners are also employing face recognition systems with high rates of inaccuracy. So it's not just them, it's their partners. 
For example, the FBI has admitted that its next generation identification database may not be sufficiently reliable to accurately locate other photos of the same identity, resulting in an increased percentage of misidentifications. Potential foreign partners, such as police departments in the United Kingdom, face use face recognition systems with false positive rates as high as 98%. <laughs> what are you guys doing? Meaning that for every 100 people identified as subjects, 98, in fact, were not suspects. Uh, you know, yeah, they point out the obvious here. P people of color and immigrants will shoulder much more of the burden of these misidentifications. For example, people of color are disproportionately represented in criminal and immigration databases due to the unfair legacy of discrimination in our criminal justice and immigration systems. Moreover, FBI and MIT research has shown that current face recognition systems misidentify people of color and women at higher rates than whites and men. And the number of mistaken IDs increases for people with darker skin tones. Think of the iPhone not being able to unlock for dark skinned users uh, situation and motion sensors at stores all over the place that don't open for darker skinned folks uh, because they don't recognize them because the system doesn't isn't you know built with that level of <laughs> range or sensitivity uh, interesting stuff um, you know that's examples of in both of those instances I believe unintentional right oversights and design whatever you want to call it <coughs> Yeah, so that, that's false positives represent real people who may erroneously become subjects in a law enforcement or immigration investigation. This is true even if a face recognition system offers several results for a search instead of one. Each of the people identified can be detained or brought in for questioning, even if there is nothing else linking them to a crime or violation. So once you're in the system, any of us, innocent or guilty, They've got your DNA, some other biometric, some obvious or non-obvious relationship that they're tracking, and for any reason a investigation is going, someone could manufacture a reason to come and talk to you, maybe arrest you. Because in a lot of cases, I think, you know, you can be arrested long before your guilt or innocence has been fully determined. I know they say they have to have probable cause, but look at this stuff. They manufacture cause out of thin air, right? <laughs> All right. In addition to accuracy problems inherent in face recognition, DHS's own immigration data has also been shown to be unacceptably inaccurate. A 2005 Migration Policy Institute study analyzing records obtained through FOIA, uh, Freedom of Information Act, right, FOIA, found 42% of NCIC immigration hits in response to police queries were false positives. Where DHS was unable to confirm that the individual is actually an immigration violator. A 2011 study of DHS's Secure Communities Program found approximately 3,600 United States citizens were improperly caught up in the program due to incorrect immigration records. As these inaccurate records are propagated throughout DHS's partner agency's systems, it will become impossible to determine the source of the inaccuracy and correct the data. I guess that's just going to, you know, the longer it's out there, the more it's going to just be, no, this is what you are. This is who you are. We, we said you, it's, it's everywhere. Everywhere you look, this is the record that it says. So, heart is fatally flawed and must be stopped. DHS's plans for future data collection and use should make us all very worried. For example, despite pushback from EFF, Georgetown, ACLU, and others. 
DHS believes it's legally authorized to collect and retain face data from millions of U.S. citizens traveling internationally. However, as Georgetown's Center on Privacy and Technology notes, Congress has never authorized face scans of American citizens. Despite this, DHS plans to roll out its face recognition program to every international flight in the country within the next four years. DHS has stated, quote, the only way for an individual to ensure he or she is not subject to collection of biometric information when traveling internationally is to refrain from traveling. Smoke weed. I didn't like this department when they made it. (laughs) (coughs) This is just the tip of the iceberg. CPB Commissioner Kevin McCallinan has stated the CBP wants to be able to use biometrics to, quote, confirm the identity of travelers at any point in their travel. Not just at entry to or exit from the United States. Okay, do you... Yeah. (laughs) This includes creating a biometric pathway to track all travelers through airports, from check-in, through security, into airport lounges and shops, and onto flights. Given CBP's recent partnerships with airlines and plans to collect social media credentials, this could also mean CBP plans to track travelers from the moment they begin their internet travel research. Several Congress members have introduced legislation to legitimize some of these plans. Yeah, lest you think that this is not being done with the full support of our wonderful elected representatives. Congress has expressed concerns with DHS's biometric programs. Senators Edward Markey and Mike Lee, in a recent letter addressed to the agency, stated, We are concerned that the use of the program on U.S. citizens remains facially unauthorized. We request that DHS stop the expansion of this program and provide Congress with its explicit statutory authority to use and expand a biometric exit program on U.S. citizens. The senators have urged DHS to propose a rulemaking to clarify its plans for biometric exit. Congress also withheld funds last year from DHS's Office of Biometric Identity Management. Hmm. Well, good job, I guess. Need to do a little more, you guys, if you ask me. Because it's not being stopped, obviously. They're wrapping it up here. DHS's Inspector General criticized the agency last year for failure to properly train its personnel on how biometric systems worked and noted that the agency's reliance on third parties to verify travelers leaving the country occasionally provided false departure or arrival status on visitors. The OIG is again investigating the biometric exit program this year and plans to assess whether biometric data collected at pilot locations has improved DHS's ability to verify departures. The Government Accountability Office has also looked into the agency's programs, criticizing the reliability of DHS's data and the agency's failure to evaluate whether a program that collects biometrics from all travelers leaving the country was even feasible. I posit that it is feasible. However, these actions are not enough. 
DHS needs to end its plans to use its heart database to collect even more biometric and biographic information about U.S. citizens and foreigners. This system poses a very real threat to the First Amendment protected activities. Further, DHS has a well-documented history of poor data management and face recognition has a high rate of misidentifications. Congress must step in with more oversight and act now to put the brakes on DHS's broad expansion of data collection. So, that was Jennifer Lynch on June 7th on EFF.org. Uh, I'll include the link to this article in the show notes, of course. My closing commentary on this story would be a, a perhaps familiar observation that I am want to give here on the show. I will include the word conspiracies in my elevator pitch about the podcast all the time to anyone who asks. I say Baked and Awake is a podcast about cannabis, conspiracies, and you. Uh, and I mean that, but I also include in that verbal utterance the invisible air quotes around one word in that sentence, and that's conspiracies, because this right here is the kind of conversation that is solidly branded conspiracy theory talk, that kind of thing. I mean, in, in polite casual lay people circles, all right, when you're on the internet splitting hairs somewhere about it, I suppose, or if you're some academic discussing what is or isn't or does or doesn't constitute um, something, <laughs> any given thing, um, that's what we're doing here, uh, is talking about things that, while they are frequently labeled as such, this is not a conspiracy. The Department of Homeland Security is running roughshod over all of our rights, it's, you know, expectations of privacy, especially as pertains to travel. But it sounds like whenever you leave the house and start moving around in the public space, go into the cities these days and there's cameras on every street corner even I'm so numb to it that you know because I refuse to you know travel around in buses that it sounds like they're sitting in sitting on the buses with you know mobile biometrics devices that they're observing us all with and recording and you know doing god knows what with because <laughs> I refuse to do that I'm, I'm riding or driving everywhere and I'm so numb to it that you know anymore when I get the the ticket in the mail for blowing a stop sign or a stop light by accident or uh, you know anything. I mean, I don't even have a reaction. I think I got one over here sitting next to me that I'm a little bit overdue on that I need to pay, but I'm gonna pay it. They know I'm gonna pay it. We all know I'm gonna pay it. It's I mean, but it's not cheap. They're 140, 150 bucks every time. We're already getting, you know. used and abused and they're charging us for it <laughs> and then they're taking that data and hanging on to that um you know and i'm sure one fine day in the not too distant future i'll be standing you know outside of a restaurant somewhere probably you know sadly still trying to suck down a joint in an alleyway under a burned out you know uh lamp and uh, end up getting talked to by some local cop who decides that even though it is technically the world's lowest priority in, in terms of everything that should be enforced in Seattle, it's going to be their reason to come up and talk to me. And maybe he's already equipped with some biometric monocle or chest cam or some other bullshit that's whispering in his ear and saying, well, this one's a you know wannabe social media internet blogosphere podcaster and he says all cats are beautiful and you know we should go talk to him 
And then I'll find myself, what, answering what kind of questions. I don't even know what. To this guy. Yeah. I don't know. Alright. It's a good time. It's a good time, you guys. That's why we smoke the weeds. <laughs> That's why we smoke the weeds. Alright, thanks for listening. Thanks for getting this far. Um, we're going to cut this one off here two big stories two big gloomy stories after you know a really great strain review thank goodness the uh nookie's treating me good um this nookie's strain from solstice cannabis was the strain of the week this week and uh like we like to do i'll include links to their website swamp boys clutch cannabis down in beautiful renton washington right in my backyard um the first time i smoked those nookies they, i was out i literally got up shut off the computer went outside and did projects and i'm talking like yard stuff for the next like three hours uh <laughs> i i yarded mulch out of that giant mulch pile i went and brought mulch to my friend's house loaded up the pickup truck with buckets and cans and trays and and containers full of mulch and brought them over to my buddy's house and dropped the mulch on his place and then took topsoil from him, compost from him, uh, back home and brought that home. Uh, half cleaned the garage for the first time all spring. Um, so yeah, uh, you could say that that was pretty good. Took good care of me. Um... We're going to catch the next couple of stories that I wanted to get into, including, you know, I keep on talking about, I'm, I'm not going to lie here, I've, I'm losing my stomach for the story about the Nexium cult and everything that goes on with that, because it's just so sad and depressing. Um, and also a lot of people are covering it and talking about it besides me, um, to the point where I feel like I want to treat it a little differently. Um eh. Yeah. So, okay, as we get ready to, as I get ready to bid you all my fondest of farewells for the week, for the day, for the day, whatever, <laughs> uh, thank you all for listening, as always. Uh, check out my friends at the Damaged Goods Network. Everybody's links are going to be in the show notes. Uh, check out my friends at the Podcast Builders League on Facebook. Uh, looking forward to continuing some conversations with friends who have been on the show before. Uh, Nate, thanks for reaching out. Uh, Mickey down in Vancouver, Washington at 1709 Records, a, a, a legit local record store uh, down there who was so kind and passed the time of day with me, talking weed, talking music, and uh, took a few cards for the shop uh, for the podcast to share with friends uh, down there. Uh, my neighbor and friend Jay, the local uh, tea table host uh from here somewhere in the lake washington corridor if you want to know more about where the tea table is to include it on your local routes get at me directly you can email me talk to us at bakedinawake.com you can find me on instagram at baked in awake you can find me on twitter all over the place um what up to my homie legion of bud you know why you already know why. Check out From the Canopy. We're going to be talking about more interesting stuff to come, including how fucked up and real deep fake videos are getting even worse than before. Coming up next week on Baked in a Wake. We're going to bring it out with the little background sounds from the Nookies drop party at the world-famous Clutch Cafe in beautiful Renton, Washington. Thank you guys for hanging with me. You know what you need to do. You need to smoke that indica and do shit anyway.